welcome to this uh, distinguished lecture of IST and uh, TSE. Uh, before I say a few words about our speaker, I'd like to say that this is uh, a rather momentous event um, in two distinct ways. Uh, it's momentous because it's the relaunch of the IST distinguished uh, lecture series, which uh, was held very successfully from, I think, 2013 to 2018, and where we decided to uh, put it on hold in 2019 because we were moving into our shiny new building and we were going to launch it again in 2020, and you all know what happened in 2020. So um, basically the distinguished lectures ground to a uh, pandemic halt, and this is the relaunch. Uh, so in lots of ways, we've been recovering from the pandemic. So uh, we're very grateful to Sam Fleischacker to give it the uh, excuse and the uh, context in which to do that. But the other dimension in which this is uh, novel and uh, momentous for us is that, as many of you will know, it is the 300th anniversary of the birth of Adam Smith. Now, Adam Smith, in addition to being, in some ways, the founder of the discipline of economics, was also... Uh, somebody who had a very particular relationship with Toulouse. Uh, he came here in 1864. Uh, it was two years after Toulouse had been in turmoil because of the Callas affair, which many of you will know about. Um, and maybe um, Sam is going to say something about it. I have no advanced knowledge of his talk. But um, Smith uh, came here as the tutor to the son of the Duke of Buccleuch, and although I think he ended up enjoying himself a lot and learning a lot and learning about things like the Canal du Midi, which he uh, wrote about later, his initial reaction was rather disappointed. And there's a famous letter from him to his great friend, David Hume, uh, saying that he uh, remembered with uh, fondness and wistfulness the days of merriment that he had passed with, with uh, Hume in Scotland because nothing like that was on offer here in Toulouse. And he said, I have begun to write a book to pass away the time. You can verily imagine I have very little to do. And so in some ways, it's always struck me as, as remarkable that we owe that wonderful book uh, of Adam Smith, The Wealth of Nations, which he began here in Toulouse, to the fact that for a while, at least, he was rather bored. I think he did not stay bored. Um, but that moment of boredom was the factor that launched the, the Wealth of Nations. We have something very grateful about that. But of course, he had a much richer interaction with Toulouse than that little anecdote suggests. And I think we're going to hear more about that. Um, so uh, in a moment, I'm going to hand over to um, Craig Smith from the University of Glasgow, who's been helping to coordinate the uh, Adam Smith events around the world. And you can tell us something about the, the context for that. Um, but let me first tell you a little bit about um, uh, Sam. Oh, and before I do that, I'd like to say that everybody here is invited to an event tomorrow morning at 9.30, where Sam will um, engage with Jonathan Haskell, who is, uh, in addition to being a distinguished uh, economist, both in industrial organization and in macroeconomics, um, is a member of the Monetary Policy uh, Committee of the Bank of England. And we're going to have a discussion about what Adam Smith had to say about um, the role of what personal characteristics and attitudes towards um, uh, knowledge and research are important in policy making. I think that's something that concerns everybody here. So um, a few quick words about Sam, but you want to hear him more than you want to hear me, so I'll let him speak for himself. Uh, he uh, uh, did his degree at Yale and has since run, uh, written very distinguished books about many aspects of uh, philosophy, um, moral and political philosophy. He's written at least five books with Adam Smith and the title that I was able to count on the enormous list on his uh, website. I think there are many others in which Smith features, even though he's not in the title. But he doesn't just write about Smith. He writes about many things. He writes about the philosophy of, of ethics, of politics, of religion, of secular society. And uh, uh, I'm very much looking forward to what he has to tell us about the Enlightenment project and what Smith added to it. But um, can I hand over first um, to our spokesman from Glasgow, where I would remind you, Adam Smith was the best of them all. Um, thanks very much. And, and, and thank you for the invitation and for your, um, your work with us in, in setting up this event. I'm um, a member of the team 
who have been celebrating um, Adam Smith's tercentenary at Glasgow and around the world. And there's another one has just arrived straight out of a taxi from the airport, my colleague Graham Roy. Um, and we, um, we've been trying to, to make the tercentenary into a, into a real opportunity for people to get interested in Adam Smith, to think about him. It's amazing how many people are, uh, are sparked into curiosity about somebody when you tell them it's their 300th birthday. And that's what we've been doing as part of our project. Um, we've been looking at Smith as a scholar, as an educator, and as a citizen. So we've been doing work um, supported by the John Templeton Foundation, which will make available um, digital scans of Smith's Glasgow lectures on jurisprudence. So they'll be available for the first time for scholars to use. We've been doing work researching Adam Smith's books and his library. We've been doing work developing educational resources. Um, but also, I think, more than anything else, what we've been trying to do is um, to host events like this in our Smith Around the World series, cooperating with universities and with um, research institutes around the world to bring Adam Smith into contemporary conversations. Um, we've had events that run through the year from um, places which were intimately connected with Smith's life, like Glasgow and Edinburgh and, um, and Kirkcaldy, and also Toulouse. Um, we're delighted to, to, to add that to the series. Um, but we've also gone out around the world to Japan, to Australia, uh, the United States, Chile, South Africa, uh, Kenya, China. And we've hosted events like this there to get people listening to conversations about Adam Smith and to get them enthused to perhaps go off and pick up their copy of The Wealth of Nations and have a look through it and see what they can learn from, um, from The Wealth of Nations. And it's an absolute pleasure um, that, um, that Sam is going to, to give one of the lectures in this series because I think Sam is one of the, the foremost experts in Adam Smith over the, the last couple of decades, who's been, I think, pivotal in bringing Smith back into serious conversations about philosophy and Smith's place as a philosopher. So I'm absolutely delighted that, that, that Sam's giving the talk, and I'm delighted we're hosting it here at the Toulouse School of Economics with your cooperation. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. Well, other than just to say, yeah, absolutely delighted to to be here. It's been quite a it's been quite a year marking the tercentenary of Smith, and we've been really struck by the enthusiasm that people have had towards Smith and and dusting off the copies, not to try and look for Smith for the answer, but actually to try and think about the the, the way that Smith approached the the political economy that he was looking at and what we can learn from that. So absolutely delighted to be here. I've made it all the way from Sydney. Um, the most difficult part of the journey was the final ten miles from the airport to to here. Um, but absolutely delighted to be here and really looking forward to the lecture tonight. I just remembered as uh, we began the proceedings that I've been told in the past that if you tell economists you're going to read a talk, they'll throw things at you. So I hope you brought your tomatoes or whatever, but uh, I will read a talk. Um, I want to thank Craig for that generous introduction and uh, Paul and Valerie and uh, Jonathan very much for, in their various ways for having made this event possible. I, it's a delight to be here in Toulouse uh, talking about Smith. Um, and uh, I was I was delighted to get your invitation, Paul. And I will point out that he said in his email that he would show me a better time than Adam Smith seems to have had in Toulouse. And so far, that's been absolutely true. I'm sure it will be true throughout. Okay, um, I would like to remind us all one thing that about Smith that to me as a philosopher is particularly important is that he did not style himself an economist. The term did not exist at the time. He was the professor of moral and political philosophy. Um, and as a professor of moral and political philosophy, I, I feel a certain bond that way. And this talk will address Smith both in the context of his Wealth of Nations and in the context of his earlier book, The Theory of Moral Sentiments, which is actually the work by which he became 
uh, well known and, and people were excited about reading The Wealth of Nations because it was written by the author of The Theory of Moral Sentiments. So I will work between those books to some extent, actually stressing The Theory of Moral Sentiments, which I'll call TMS for short. Um, but it, uh, but what I have to say will, I think, bear, well, does bear on both of the books. So I'm going to begin this talk by going over a point I've made in earlier work about how Smith's Wealth of Nations employs techniques he developed in his theory of moral sentiments to change its reader's prejudicial image, image of poor people. I'll then stress the fact that Smith combats a prejudice by presenting a new image of the group targeted by that prejudice, rather than responding to wrong-headed beliefs about that group. I take this feature of his work to suggest that Smith had a rather different conception of prejudice than most of his Enlightenment peers. If correct, this suggestion brings out a striking and hitherto unnoticed way in which Smith enriched the entire Enlightenment project of unmasking prejudice and anticipated critical strategies that have been fully developed only quite recently. What Smith most contributes to later thinking about poverty is not so much a set of proposals for alleviating it, although he does make some proposals along these lines, but a new image of the poor. More important than this or that policy in Smith, says Gertrude Himmelfarb, was the image of the poor implicit in those policies. She adds, quote, if the wealth of nations was less than novel in its theories of money, trade, or value, it was genuinely revolutionary in its view of poverty and its attitude towards the poor. Other scholars agree. Knut Harkinson has called the Wealth of Nations the greatest working man's tract ever written. The intellectual historian Daniel Bao, who we'll come to more in a moment, has argued that the Wealth of Nations was the primary intellectual source to break the hold of the condescending views of the poor that had hitherto held sway. Bao brings out nicely what was so revolutionary about Smith's image of the poor. Few people before Smith, he points out, thought that the world either could or should do without a class of poor people. Until the late 18th century, most Christians believed that God had ordained a social hierarchy with truly virtuous people at the top and the poor and inferior sort at the bottom. Of course, those at the top were supposed to help the people at the bottom, but not enough to raise them out of poverty, out of their proper place. Almsgiving was understood as a means to redemption on the part of the almsgiver, and the existence of poor people was seen as integral to God's plan for future for human life. As late as 1728, the humanitarian Isaac Watts could say that, quote, great God has wisely ordained that among mankind there should be some rich and some poor, and the same providence hath allotted to the poor the meaner services, unquote. Says Bao, and this is the first quotation on your handout, in 1750 there were two widely held attitudes towards the poor. The dominant one supposed that the poor should never have misery lifted from them, nor their children be encouraged to look beyond the plow or loom. It reflected traditional notions of social hierarchy and was reinforced by economic theories about labor and motivation. The other attitude was derived chiefly from Christian ethics. It held that the duty of the rich was to treat the poor with kindness and compassion and to aid them in times of distress. This benevolent attitude did not provide a suitable basis for policy making, rather it was a reminder of conscience, of the fact that the ill-clad, filthy, laboring masses, habitually viewed with contempt by their betters, were equally God's creatures, whom a Christian community could neither exclude nor ignore. The major breakthrough in getting beyond these two attitudes, says Bao, quote, came in 1776 when a philosopher of great learning, penetration, and literary persuasiveness published his inquiry into the nature and causes of the wealth of nations, unquote. Smith combated both the explicit condescension of the first view and the implicit condescension of, uh, condescension of the second one. He virulently opposed the notion that the poor are in any way inferior to the well-off. 
Over and over again, he pricks the vanity upholding a contemptuous picture of the virtues and skills of the poor. He presents poor people as, as having the same native abilities as everyone else. Quote, the difference in natural talents in different men is in reality much less than we are aware of, he says. Habit and education make for most of that supposedly great gap between the philosopher and the street porter, even though, quote, the vanity of the philosopher is willing to acknowledge scarce any resemblance between the two. To those who complain that the poor are naturally indolent, Smith declares that, on the contrary, they are, quote, very apt to overwork themselves, unquote. To those, and these were legion, even among advocates of the poor, who saw indulgence in drink as a vice characteristic of poor people, Smith replies that, quote again, man is an anxious animal and must have his care swept off by something that can exhilarate the spirits. That's a quote from the lectures on jurisprudence, which he didn't publish, which you can now find online, as Craig just said, told us. But it also exists in hard copy if you would like to read it um, in print. To those who complained that the poor were affecting the manners of their betters and should be prevented from buying luxury goods, Smith says that it is but equity for the lower ranks of society to share in the food, clothes, and housing that they themselves produce. And to those who claim to be protecting the poor from their own prodigality, he says it is, quote, the highest impertinence and presumption in kings and ministers to pretend to watch over the economy of private people, unquote. These kings and ministers, he adds, are themselves always and without any exception, the greatest spendthrifts in society. This is not the end of the list. Smith defends the religious choices of poor people against the contempt and fear of his Enlightenment colleagues, pointing out that the religious sects that poor people tend to join, while sometimes, quote, disagreeably rigorous and unsocial, unquote, provide them with community and moral guidance. He repeatedly praises the virtues and accomplishments of independent laborers, maintain, maintaining that it is unnecessary as well as inappropriate to monitor and control them. He even tries to excuse, if not quite to justify, the mob violence characteristic of workers in their struggles with their employers. Smith thus presents a remarkably dignified picture of the poor, a picture in which they make choices every bit as respectable as those of their social superiors, in which there are therefore no true inferiors and superiors at all. Individual people may be good or bad, of course, but Smith urges his well-off readers to see the average poor person as just like their friends, relatives, or themselves, equal in intelligence, virtue, ambition, and interests with every other human being, and hence equal in rights and desert, in dignity. It is indeed this picture of the poor that first makes possible the idea that poverty is something that society should try to overcome. If poor people are equal in dignity to everyone else and are deserving, therefore, of whatever we would give our friends and relatives, then we can begin to see poverty as a harm an injury, something that, since we would not have it inflicted on anyone we liked or respected, we should not be willing to have inflicted on anyone at all. Now, it is deeply appropriate if, as Himmelfarb suggests, a dignified picture of the poor is Smith's most novel contribution in The Wealth of Nations. For then, The Wealth of Nations' greatest triumph is a shift in our moral imaginations, and it was the central teaching of TMS that our imaginations are what most profoundly shape our characters and moral attitudes. In TMS, Smith tells us that we can truly sympathize with others only when we enter imaginatively and in great detail into their situations. And this is the second quotation on your handout. The spectator must endeavor as much as he can to bring home to himself every little circumstance of distress which can possibly occur to the sufferer. He must adopt the whole case of his companion with all its minutest incidents and strive to render as perfect as possible that imaginary change of situation upon which his sympathy is founded. Only by putting ourselves in imagination into the whole case of others 
with all its minutest incidents, can we come to share their feelings and thereby to develop benevolence, respect, or any other moral attitude towards them. And in The Wealth of Nations, Smith puts us into the situation of the poor in great detail and thereby overturns ancient stereotypes against them. Let's turn now to the broader significance of Smith's effort to undermine a prejudice, the prejudice against the poor, by way of images and what it might tell us about Smith's relationship to the rest of the Enlightenment. Peter Gay has rightly written that, quote, in its intellectual style, the wealth of na nations is a cardinal document of the Enlightenment, unquote. Gay fleshes out this characterization by pointing to the secularity, the empiricism, the pragmatism, and the optimism of the book. He could have added its goal of undermining prejudice. Smith explicitly describes some of the views he opposes in The Wealth of Nations as prejudices, and elsewhere uses synonyms for prejudice for them, like delusions, absurdities, or follies. And he describes his own aim as bringing a perspicuity, his word, to the subject of economics that will enable his reader to see through these barriers to good judgment. I should say uh, on the side, I always tell people, even though I work on Smith, I don't really understand economics. So don't ask me any questions about economics. But the first time I felt that I did understand it was on reading Adam Smith. And apparently many of his readers in, the day, in his day it wasn't so much that he was saying something new, but they finally felt it was clear to them. They finally felt it made sense. Uh, so even to this day, I think, even in his 18th century language, he clarifies economics more than most people and in more than most economic textbooks, um, I would argue, I suggest at least. Um, in any case, I would, I'm saying here that the goal of perspicuity, which is very important to him, was in part a goal to undermine prejudice because the idea is that prejudice is something which when you see clearly, you'll be able to overcome. But anyway, I digress. At one point, he compares the popular a revulsion against corn merchants to the fear of witches and maintains that laws establishing a complete freedom of trade in corn, quote, would probably prove as effectual to put an end to the popular fears of engrossing and forestalling, unquote, as the laws that abolished prosecutions of witches were in ridding people of the fear of witches. But one central way by which the enlighteners of the 18th century understood their project was precisely as a struggle to banish prejudice and superstition. Immanuel Kant put this view succinctly, and this is 3A on the handout. To think for oneself is the maxim of an unprejudiced way of thinking. It is the maxim of a reason that is never passive. A propensity to passive reason, and hence to a heteronomy of reason, is called prejudice and liberation from prejudices generally may be called enlightenment. Famously, Kant makes these points also in his little essay, What is Enlightenment?, which has come to be seen as a paradigmatic characterization of what the enlightenment was all about. He calls thinking for oneself the key to enlightenment there and presents it as a process that can by itself free us from the constraints of prejudice. Now, it's notable that Kant promoted a rather different and more egalitarian picture of enlightenment than many of his peers. To say that the goal of enlightenment is overcoming prejudice is to, to suggest that it is not necessarily a matter of increasing one's knowledge. Others construed enlightenment primarily as a matter of increasing our knowledge about topics of practical use to human life, like agriculture and medicine, or science more generally, or theology and philosophy. Practically all the Enlighteners, it should be said, including both Kant and Smith, believe that increasing our knowledge about these topics was a very worthwhile aim. But not all considered it to be the main aim of enlightenment. Kant says explicitly that his notion of enlightenment demands less of people than one that, quote, places enlightenment in the acquisition of information, unquote. Thinking for oneself is, after all, something that everyone can do. So the aspect of the Enlightenment that set out to undo, undo superstition and prejudice differs in important ways from the aspect that set out to increase our knowledge. 
prejudices are not normally understood to run, result just from ignorance, after all, or beliefs that merely happen to be false. They are instead, quite literally, prejudgments, or urteilen in German, or préjugé in, in French. Beliefs are attitudes that we hold before or without judging at all. They are false because we haven't adequately used our epistemic faculties to examine them, not just because we have incorrect information. That's why they can be assimilated to follies, absurdities, and delusions in Smith, and why Smith might presume that simply laying out the workings of economics perspicuously might lead them to disappear. If enlightenment consists in overcoming this kind of error, it can be spread very widely. Anyone with good judgment or what Kant calls common sense or a healthy human understanding should be able to achieve it. If enlightenment consists primarily in mastering scientific or philosophical theories by contrast, it may necessarily be an elite achievement. These points are not insignificant for an understanding of what Smith and Kant regarded as the political significance of their epistemic and social scientific work. But for the moment, I want to focus on another issue. I describe prejudices as beliefs or attitudes just now. But which are they? Beliefs and attitudes are not the same thing. The first are cognitive items, while the second are sentiments. And it would seem, at least, that what we need to do to correct a belief is quite different from what we need to do to correct a sentiment. The entire program of public education we might set for ourselves, if our target is false beliefs, is likely to look quite different from a program of public education directed at misguided sentiments. Smith's Enlightenment peers largely characterized prejudices as beliefs. Condorcet declared, this is the fourth item on the handout, that men retain the prejudices of their childhood, their country, and their age long after they have discovered all the truths necessary to destroy them. But if prejudices are things that truths should be able to destroy, then they would seem to be falsehoods, incorrect beliefs that we hold on to in spite of the evidence we encounter against them. Voltaire defined prejudice, this is the fifth on the handout, as an opinion without judgment, giving as examples beliefs that theft and selfish lying are wrong when taken on by young children simply because their parents tell them these things. These particular beliefs turn out to be good prejudices for him. They are true, he believes, and will accordingly be ratified by judgment when one comes to reason. But he insists that all prejudices, even true ones, must at some point be brought to the tribunal of reason. They are therefore for him too beliefs, the sorts of things that reason can evaluate. And the same is true for Kant, who tells us that in uh, 3b on the handout, prejudices are provisional judgments so far as they are adopted as principles. Sometimes, but not always, Hume takes a similar view of prejudice. In his essay of the origin of government, for instance, he assimilates prejudices to principles and opinions. This is 6a on the handout. Religion is commonly found to be a very intractable principle, and other principles or prejudices frequently resist all the authority of the civil magistrate whose power, being founded on opinion, can never subvert other opinions equally rooted with that of his title to, do to dominion. But elsewhere, as in 6b, Hume treats prejudice as a kind of sentiment. Nature has given all animals a prejudice in favor of their offspring, he says in The Skeptic. And when he admonishes critics of beauty to free their minds from prejudice and of the standard of taste, he has in mind an attitude that favors or disfavors an artist because she is a friend or enemy, a rival or commentator. He also identifies the virtuous and tender sentiments with prejudices in an essay explicitly entitled Of Moral Prejudices. Hume is not unique in this regard. In a famous passage praising prejudice, uh, this is a long passage under seven, uh, probably the most famous passage on prejudice on this handout, 
Edmund Burke declares that in this enlightened age, I am bold enough to confess that we are generally men of untaught feelings, that instead of casting away all our old prejudices, we cherish them to a very considerable degree. We being here Englishmen, as opposed to those terrible Frenchmen who are destroying all prejudices in the early stages of the French Revolution. Um, he, he foresees that this will lead to great violence, and it is worth noting that to come up with that in 1790 showed a great deal of foresight. The revolution had not yet reached its, its extremely bloody stage. Burke goes on almost immediately, however, to defend prejudices on the ground that we are afraid to put men to live and trade each on his own private stock of reason because we suspect that this stock in each man is small and that the individuals would do better to avail themselves of the general bank and capital of nations and of ages. This, of course, implies that prejudices are elements of reason, not sentiments. We find both notions of prejudice in Smith. That a country's wealth consists in the quality, quantity of precious metals that circulate in it is something that vulgar prejudices suppose, he says. Colbert, unfortunately, embraced all the prejudices of the mercantile system, and several universities, he says, have served as sanctuaries in which exploded systems and obsolete prejudices find shelter and protection after they have been hunted out of every other corner of the world. In each of these cases, the prejudice in question is clearly a belief. On the other hand, Smith tells us that we sympathize with joy in others whenever we are not prejudiced by envy, and that the mean principle of national prejudice is often founded upon the noble one of the love of our own country. Here, prejudices are clearly sentiments. In yet other places, Smith's use of the word is ambiguous, as when he expresses uncertainty over whether the disapproval of certain professions comes from, quote, reason or prejudice, unquote. What we don't find in other Enlightenment authors, as far as I know, is the idea that prejudicial sentiments may arise from a picture, an image we hold of their targets, not precisely a propositional representation, not a belief exactly, but not something entirely independent of cognition either. Smith at one point explicitly refers to prejudice, prejudices of the imagination. This is 8C, and of course, it's where I took the title for this lecture. Here, the prejudice by which we attribute a happiness superior to any other to kings and lovers. More generally for Smith, our sympathetic sentiments, which, remember, does not necessarily mean sentiments that favor other people, just sentiments that arise from our thinking ourselves into their position, are all products of our imaginations. Unlike Hume, for whom passions are non-rational, referring to nothing beyond themselves, Smith argued that the feelings of a mature, socialized human being normally do refer, at least implicitly, to objects that we imagine should call up these feelings. Socialized human beings have second order feelings that take first order feelings as their objects. And we come now to nine on the handout. Bring a person into society, Smith says, and all his own passions will immediately become the causes of new passions. He will observe that mankind approve of some of them and are disgusted by others. He will be elevated in the one case and cast down in the other. His desires and aversions, his joys and sorrows will now often become the causes of new desires and aversions, new joys and new sorrows. And these new second order desires and aversions to have first order feelings that others approve of and avoid first order feelings of which they disapprove can be satisfied only if we adjust our first order feelings to what we imagine an impartial spectator would feel in our circumstances. Quote, we suppose ourselves the spectators of our own behavior and endeavor to imagine what effect it would in this light produce upon us. Our feelings about the things around us will thus be thoroughly shaped by our imagination. This will be yet more true, moreover, of our feelings about the people around us. 
For Smith, we are always assessing the feelings of other people in accordance with the way we imagine an impartial and well-informed spectator would assess them. This leads us to an admiring picture of some people, a contemptuous picture of others. Smith indeed expressly describes the idea of propriety and virtue by which we assess others as an image, this is 10 on the handout, something that is more or less accurately drawn its coloring is more or less just. Its outlines are more or less exactly designed according to the delicacy and acuteness of that sensibility with which those observations were made. We have a picture in our mind of who we want to be, and we try to live up to that picture. So our feelings about both the things and the people around us and ourselves are shaped by images for Smith. They are therefore always liable, if those images are misleading, to being shaped by prejudicial images. Smith thus makes room for a type of prejudice that lies somewhere between prejudices of belief and prejudices of sentiment. The workings of our imagination are neither strictly beliefs nor strictly sentiments for Smith, while, even while affecting both our beliefs and our sentiments. They take place at a level somewhat below the level of belief, of conscious, explicit representation. And to change them, if they need changing, we need a strategy quite different from the tools we might use to refute an incorrect or poorly thought out belief. At the same time, they are shaped by our cognitive faculties, so changing them cannot be the sort of pure retraining we might use if we were dealing with a sentiment. If this is right, it suggests that Smith anticipated a view of prejudice that has received sustained attention only in recent times. Consider a distinction be between doxastic and non-doxastic prejudices. I realize doxastic is a jargon term for philosophers. It just means having to do with belief. It's related to doxa, the Greek for belief. Uh, considered as in orthodoxy, if you need to remember it. Consider the distinction between doxastic and non-doxastic prejudices drawn by the contemporary epistemologist and political philosopher Miranda Fricker. Fricker defines testimonial injustices as lowering the credibility we attribute to a speaker because of a prejudice we hold that people of her race, gender, religion, or class are ignorant or dishonest. Many of these prejudices, she adds, are non-doxastic. Her word, that's why I'm using it. They operate below the level of an explicit belief. And about this sort of prejudice, she says, this is 11A on the handout, while it may be hard enough to police one's beliefs for prejudice, it is significantly harder reliably to filter out the prejudicial stereotypes that inform one's social perception without doxastic mediation. Many instances of testimonial injustice will be owing not to prejudiced beliefs at all, but only to stealthier, residual prejudices, whose content may even be flatly inconsistent with the beliefs actually held by the subject. Fricker characterizes these stealthy, non-doxastic prejudices and illustrates them as follows. This is 11b. Walter Lippmann is widely cited as popularizing our metaphorical use of stereotype to mean social type. Its literal meaning signifies the mold used in printing. And accordingly, Lippmann defines social stereotypes as pictures in our heads. This seems as good an off the cuff description as any. If we think of a social stereotype as an image, which expresses an association between a social group and one or more attributes, and which thereby embodies one or more generalizations about that social group, then it becomes clearer how its impact on judgment can be harder to detect than that of a belief with the same content. Images are capable of a visceral impact on judgment, which allows them to condition our judgments without our awareness, whereas it would take an unconscious belief to do so with comparable stealth. This is most starkly illustrated when the influence of prejudicial images from the social imagination persists in a hearer's patterns of judgment, even where their content conflicts with the content of her beliefs. <clears throat> 
Imagine, for example, a woman who has freed herself of sexist beliefs, a card-carrying feminist, as they say, and yet her psychology remains such that in many contexts, she is influenced by a stereotype of women as lacking the requisite authority for political office, so that she tends not to take the word of female political con candidates as seriously as that of their male counterparts. It can be that cognitive commitments held in our imaginations retain their impact on how we perceive the social world, even after any correlative beliefs have faded away. Note that the prejudice of the imagination that Fricker presents to us here operates independently of any prejudice of belief. And her example is a telling one, which seems not just plausible, but familiar. I submit that her example makes clear a notion that is already in Smith, albeit not nearly so well explained, and that it characterizes perfectly how Smith understands our prejudices against the poor. Let's explore this suggestion in more detail. Our prejudices against the poor arise for Smith from features of the way we sympathize that we are barely even aware of, our preference for sympathizing with joy rather than grief in particular, and they lead us not so much to disapprove of poor people as to overlook them. And this is now 12 on the handout. The poor man is ashamed of his poverty. He feels that it either places him out of the sight of mankind or that if they take any notice of him, they have scarce any fe fellow feeling with the misery and distress which he suffers. He's mortified upon both accounts for though to be overlooked, and to be disapproved of are things entirely different. Yet as obscurity covers us from the daylight of honor and approbation, to feel that we are taken no notice of disappoints the most ardent desire of human nature. It's a particularly beautiful passage, I think, in TMS. Now I might read this passage as saying that we have no image of the poor. Smith describes them as overlooked after all. But in the context of what he says elsewhere, I think we can't read the passage that way. Throughout both his lectures on jurisprudence and his Wealth of Nations, Smith clearly thinks that we do have an image of poor people as lazy, profligate, violent, prone to dark drunkenness and the like. So overlooking the poor must mean, as the passage I have just quoted explicitly suggests, having, quote, scarce any fellow feeling with them not bothering to enter empathetically into their lives, taking no notice of their condition or of the achievements or failings by which they might merit honor and approbation, which results in an image that exactly fits Fricker's definition of a stereotype, and an image drawn from the social imagination rather than our own personal imaginations. Quote, which embodies from Fricka, which embodies one or more generalizations about a particular group, unquote. Generalized attributes drawn from what everyone around us says about a certain group rush in to provide content for an image of people when we fail to fill out that image by attending empathetically to their lives. And if we impose the resulting stereotype on our subsequent experience of them, instead of trying to enter into their experience imaginatively, we will continue to overlook them. We will continue to fail to notice them. But if we impose a stereotype on poor people rather than looking at them, if we refuse to see them in the daylight of honor and approbation, then of course we will attribute dishonorable motivations to them when they drink, don't show up to work, or spend money on what seem to us luxuries. We will not see them as capable of honorable motivations. If we are to understand them empathetically, first we need to remove the obscurity that covers them. That is what Smith tries to do in The Wealth of Nations. That is the point of his putting us over and over into the details of their circumstances, of his nudging us to think ourselves into what it is like to be them. Only such a series of imaginative exercises can overturn a stereotype in Lippmann's and Fricker's technical sense. Only that will engage with our prejudicial Im images enough to remake them. 
Like the card-carrying feminist who retains a stereotype about women that inclines her to dismiss female politicians, many people who have come to recognize intellectually that the poor are as capable and decent as their better-off peers may yet find themselves looking down on a person whose speech or dress betrays them as working class. A prejudicial image, a stereotype, a mode of feeling shaped by a mode of imagining needs to be overturned by a new image before the intellectual rejection of such a prejudice can take effect. Aside from the one passage that uses the phrase prejudices of the imagination, Smith does not explicitly lay out the image-based view of prejudice I have just described. Much of what he says fits nicely with such a view, however. Considered to begin with, his claim that moral education is best accomplished by way of face-to-face -face interactions rather than explicit indoctrination. The practice among the upper classes of sending children away to fancy schools, he says, seems to have hurt most essentially the domestic morals both of France and England. If you really wish, quote, to educate your children to be dutiful to their parents and kind and affectionate to their br brothers and sisters, better to keep them home. Quote, respect for you must always impose a very useful restraint upon their conduct and respect for them may frequently impose no useless restraint upon your own, unquote. It's actually, I think, quite nice advice about educating children from a man who never had children, but uh, maybe as an outsider, he could understand it better than the insiders. A few pages earlier, he tells us that habitual sympathy is the source of affection, and he goes on to argue that such sympathy is what makes for friendship among professional colleagues and neighbors. The idea that a habitual, often silent exchange of sympathies with others is more likely to enable us to build friendships and develop virtue than any explicit teaching is carried over into the wealth of nations, moreover. Smith tells us there that the Greeks had a formal educational program designed to, quote, humanize the mind and to dispose it for performing all the social and moral duties of public and private life, unquote, while the Romans did not. But the morals of the Romans, both in private and public life, seem to have been a good deal superior to those of the Greeks. So if overcoming prejudicial attitudes is part of virtue, as Smith seems to believe, then the informal education that we get from habitual sympathy, rather than the explicit education that the Greeks took to be necessary, will presumably be most effective in achieving that moral goal as well. That in turn implies, however, that the prejudices we are trying to overcome are less a matter of beliefs than attitudes, and the misleading imaginings cut off from sympathy that give rise to such attitudes. This suggestion can moreover be backed up by Smith's famous remark in The Wealth of Nations that, quote, commerce ought naturally to be among nations as among individuals, a bond of union and friendship, unquote, and his claim in TMS that writers of imaginative fiction are often much better moral instructors than philosophers. Face-to-face -face acquaintance and imaginative exercises are what truly humanize the mind and enable us to become friends with one another for Smith. That implies that they are what truly enables us to overcome prejudice, and that prejudice is, accordingly, largely a matter of images rather than beliefs. So Smith seems to have anticipated a subtle notion of prejudice and how it can be corrected that has been fully recognized only in the present day. I believe that Smith was also right about both the nature of this kind of prejudice and how it can best be overcome. Which brings me in closing to some lessons we might take away from Smith for our own day. The first is that long dead writers like Smith can be a more useful source for thinking about even such current topics as epistemic injustice than current academic prejudices allow. At the same time, present day ways of sorting out things like the differences among doxastic, attitudinal, and image-based prejudices can give us a richer understanding of what exactly writers like Smith were up to what exactly indeed the entire Enlightenment project of bringing people out of pre prejudice may have amounted to. <laughs>
A second related lesson is that we should not assume that writers from the past are uninterested in a certain prejudice merely because they don't explicitly name it. Sometimes indirect moral teaching is the best moral teaching, and we should look to how to see how authors present a group, not just what they explicitly say about it, to figure out their relationship to a prejudice against it. In Smith's case, The Wealth of Nations can readily be read a scene as a work that sets out to undermine prejudices about the poor, even if it rarely presents itself as such explicitly. As noted earlier, this suggests a deep connection between the theory of moral sentiments and the wealth of nations. The moral teachings of TMS on the view I've developed here structure a great deal of what the wealth of nations accomplishes. Third, if I am right about Smith, and Smith is right about prejudice, direct acquaintance with people supplemented by imaginative literature may be more likely to undermine our prejudices of the imagination than any explicit preaching against such prejudices or any theoretical model designed to display the structure of our prejudices to us. In order to shake up our prejudices against people from Africa or India, perhaps, we should go there and spend time with the people there, or at least read novels and see plays or movies about them. The best thing probably is to visit them while reading novels and seeing plays and movies about them. Then we can enter imaginatively into their lives when we speak to them, rather than encountering them even in face-to-face -face interactions via stereotype. The same is true if we want to overcome prejudices against Muslims, Jews, Native Americans, or gray, uh, or gay or transgender people. Transphobia will be overcome precisely when children read novels or memoirs from the perspective of trans people in school, and may well be best overcome when those novels and memoirs avoid directly preaching the virtues of openness to LGBTQ lifestyles. This tells against the educational program of certain American conservatives, but also of those on the left who want to address prejudice more directly. It goes with this last point that prejudice can run rather deeper than either belief or sentiment, and a prejudice rooted in a stereotypical image may take repeated long-term work to uproot. This is not necessarily to endorse the notion of implicit bias, which is often construed as evading conscious awareness altogether, and therefore, in my opinion, attributed to people without adequate supporting evidence, but it at least warns us that we may find one that we may find misleading stereotypical images retaining their grip on us, even if we have tried hard on the doxastic level, level to eliminate them. Fricka's example of the feminist who cannot quite free herself from sexist prejudices is a good one. And the same point can surely be made about class, racial, and religious prejudices. Finally, Attention to the role that prejudices of the imagination play in our lives should lead us to give less importance to moral and political theories in improving ourselves and our societies and greater importance to everyday human interactions and imaginative literature. That is all to the good, I think. Moral philosophers often exaggerate the importance of theory, believing that if we can only get our principles right, everything else in our personal and political lives will fall into place. This is an illusion, I think, and one to which Smith never fell prone, an illusion against which, indeed, much of his work in both TMS and The Wealth of Nations is directed. Everyday human interaction and an expansion of our everyday moral imaginations can do far more for us morally than theory. If the theory of moral sentiments and the wealth of nations taught us nothing else, that would alone give them enduring value. Thank you. Thank you, Sam. Um... Uh, you hold on to that at the moment. So, uh, questions. I'm going to, if you could put your hands up, I'm going to pass um, the uh, mics around. Thank you. You and then. Thank you. 
Um, thank you for this uh, very, very moving lecture. So the, the emphasis you place on imagination, which is very, very powerful and very evocative, I was just thinking there are limits to that because when you imagine, and all your examples talked about imagining a person, an individual, and prejudice, in my understanding of it, is often directed not at an individual. We often find, you know, structural prejudice is, you know, directed at a group. And you'll often find very deeply racist or prejudiced people saying, oh, when it comes to such and such individual, um, no, I see his merits and I see his suffering. I empathize with his, with his problems. And that doesn't seem to prevent that particular person from being racist against the group. So this emphasis you place that you say Adam Smith placed on imagination and empathy, I'm just thinking has its limits when, when one is faced with structures of violence that aren't directed at an individual. Yeah, that's a great point. I'm not going to, I'm not going to deny the large amount of truth in what you say, and I may be exaggerating one kind of uh, aspect of overcoming prejudice at the cost of others. I'm not, I don't want to say that there isn't other work that we need to do as well. However, I do want to suggest, and I think this is in line with Smith's own work. First of all, just as a as a, as a claim on my own part, and some will disagree with this, I think prejudices against groups are often overturned to the extent that they are precisely by entering imaginatively into a single other individual or a few other individuals. I did say this is something that has to happen many times. Um, and I, you know, Smith doesn't actually name the individual poor people he's talking about in, in The Wealth of Nations. And sometimes he speaks in the plural as in workmen are too often uh, inclined to, over, to overwork themselves. Um, but often the examples are in a, uh, in the singular. There's a case that I'm struck by always because it's, I, I find it very moving, even though it just seems to be a rather dry section of text in which he is talking about um, the high rate, he thinks, of uh, child mortality in certain regions. And he talks about how you will see uh, many children around um, playing the drums or, or fifes or whatever around in a barracks, but you'll re rarely see them grown up. And then he talks about a single mother, not a, not named, who mm -hmm. will have ma many children and then just one survive. And the fact that it's a single person, I think, makes it easier to empathize, makes it easier to enter into, this, into the condition. Now, is, this is not a surefire cure. Um, entering into the condition of individual people doesn't overturn prejudice for many people. But I think it is true that often that is precisely the breakthrough moment. I would say for myself in my own life, encountering people who I'd only known as a group, and then I suddenly meet them one-on-one, -on -one, um, and sometimes not even that, sometimes read a novel about a, about a Hindu or Muslim, or a way of life that, I, that is very, uh, both very unfamiliar to me, has been very powerful in overturning uh, uh, prejudices on my part. Now, it is important that it, you don't just encounter them. You do need to do the empathetic work. Uh, you do need to use the imagination. And I, I love to stress the fact that Smith says you have to enter into the, their whole case, all the details of their circumstances. So if you do so, do this very in a very shallow way, you might just confirm your own prejudices. But if you do it more thoroughly, and especially if you do it repeatedly, I do think that that is something that contributes significantly to overcoming prejudice. May not be the only thing. Um, so thank you for this great talk. So I'm an evolution biologist and uh, listening to this talk reminded me of um, a recent uh, book by um, a neurobiologist, uh, Robert Sapolsky. I don't know if you're aware of uh, of this uh, his work. Um, so this book is called Determined and uh, basically he uh, makes an argument that, um, you know, there is no free will basically, that, uh, you know, our environment, we, our decisions are so much determined by the genetics and environment and many other things. And he kind of pushes, I feel like even pushes this argument to its limit that, 
uh, that you know that it's almost impossible to have any kind of mm, so uh, any kind of uh, judgment on on other people uh, because so much of it is determined by outside of our control and it has very strong far fetching implications to you know uh, society and I I just wanted to you know hear I mean this is uh, you know. A conversation about free will is, uh, you know, another level of it. But kind of on your thoughts on on this, that do, do you think like if if this this kind of touches upon um, at the limit the question of free will and how much do we have it and what would be the implications to society if we cannot really, um, you know, we we cannot really. Uh, um, that individual agents do not have that much that much power to begin with. So yeah, um that would be a different lecture, but um I will say a couple things about it. Certainly, if we had no free will, then there, there's no point in trying to if you're convinced of that, it would seem at least as if there's no point in trying to overcome your prejudices and we're stuck with whatever we have. Um there are commitments and presuppositions that are built into various disciplines. Neurobiologists tend to start from a position by which free will doesn't make any sense. Does, it doesn't figure into their work. You can't, you can't find it experimentally. So it, I, I actually suspect rather strongly that in this case, as in many other cases of scientists who work either on human biology or on human social structures, they start from an assumption that there's no free will. So it's built into the methodological way they approach things. Philosophers, not all philosophers, but many start from the opposite assumption. I have to confess, I came to Smith as, as, a, as a Kantian, you've heard Kant mentioned here. Kant is a very strong believer in uh, free will, but I can't go into great detail on this now. He rather nicely, I think, does not try to refute the scientific reasons that people might have for denying free will. He simply, he, he actually does see uh, a determinism as a presupposition of doing scientific work, of doing any kind of empirical work. And then free will becomes something which is also a presupposition if you want to um, make moral choices. Whenever you make a choice, you presuppose that you have free will. He says, and I think he's right on that. Uh, you can read the book all you like, but at the end of the day, you'll have to decide whether you are going to keep your promises, show up to work the next day, go to this place or that, and you'll presuppose free will in the course of doing that. Um, more deeply, but more controversially, I think Smith uh, Kant um, has an argument by which you can't even really, although determinism may be a pre uh, a uh, presupposition of looking at empirical evidence and coming up with conclusions, you also presuppose free will in determining which conclusions you think are, in deciding which conclusions you think are correct and which are not. So the author of that book had to look at a bunch of evidence and then choose to say, this is the correct one. And that I think, if he, were, if he simply saw his own conclusions as determined, he could not also say they were correct. And if you, upon reading it, find it persuasive, then you can't also say you're determined. Otherwise, you can just say, oh, I'm determined to come to this conclusion. Now, that's much too simple. A simple there would be philosophers who don't like the way I just accounted for things. And Smith doesn't talk about free will, or barely does. He seems to believe in it, but his friend Hume didn't really leave any space for it. And he doesn't tend, he tends not to contradict Hume on major metaphysical and epistemological issues. So um, it's kind of on the side. Uh, Kant was particularly fond of Smith. And I think that's partly because there's a kinship on, in many uh, respects, including this one that Smith might have rather liked Kant's defense of free will if he'd ever known about it, but he didn't. So it's completely speculative to, to say anything about Smith on free will. And thanks for the interesting lecture. And you know, I, I love all of this historical reference. So my question is, is um, there's an aspect of the work presented here on prejudice that felt a little bit incomplete, and I'm going to use an analogy to try to explain it. So a bit of an electrical engineering analogy, thinking that, you know, since prejudice involves an interaction, there is a transmitter and there is a receiver. 
And this was very much a talk about prejudice from the transmitter's perspective, but not from the receiver's perspective. So let me give you an example. Let's say I'm having a discussion with Paul, you know, and we have a disagreement and, and you know, basically Paul flips me off, whatever. You know, I could interpret that, you know, for instance, as like I'm South American, you know, I'm considered inferior and he's flipping me off because he doesn't value me, he doesn't consider. In that case, maybe he didn't mean that. Yes, <laughs> oh. <laughs> conceived, you said. Yes, exactly, in Chile, yes. <laughs> but you you get where i'm going so in some sense it could be that yes maybe he had a you know a, an idea about me and make him act him in a certain way but maybe it wasn't that maybe it was that i have an idea about the idea that i expect him to have about me so as a receiver i have like this you know prejudgment that is quite different than the one of the emitter and therefore, I react negatively. I say, like, no, it's not that Paul really had an argument. It's because he's actually denying me because of the way that he perceives me. And now, all of a sudden, that interaction didn't generate, you know, more empathy or, or improvement in the relationship. I, I use interaction in my overreaction to now validate my idea that I'm being prejudged against. So it felt that the talk was only about the emitter but not about the receiver. And I want you to comment on that other aspect because in an interaction, you have to have both. Yeah, yeah, no, that's a nice point. I, I don't think that you'll find many 18th century writers of any kind talking about what it's like to be at the other end of a prejudice, as it were. They talk about prejudice as something you need to overcome insofar as you've received them. Fricka does. In fact, even in that quote, she talks about the feminist who is still um, affected by a prejudice against her, her own group, as it were. It's, it's not so much she's seeing herself in that light, um, in that quote. In the rest of her book, she does talk quite a bit about how people internalize prejudices. It's not quite the same thing as you're uh, bringing up, but then see themselves in the light of a certain prejudice. Um, I think that's an interesting topic in any case to explore. And I certainly have had that phenomenon myself, uh, experienced that phenomenon. All right, I will give this example. I'm not sure, I feel a little uncomfortable about it, but um, I'm Jewish and I'm somewhat observant. And that means that at times I put on a yarmulke, kippah. When I don't wear the kippah, nobody treats me as if I'm Jewish. At least I don't notice that they do unless they know me. When I do, some people clearly do, and some people I think do, whether they are or not. So I'm worried about being seen through the light of a prejudice. Um, and so especially if somebody acts in a not nice way, then I think it's because I've got the key part, which actually is one reason why I don't wear it, because I don't want to see myself in that light or to see other people's interactions with me in that light. Um, I was just teaching Franz Fanon with, uh, to my students, and he actually contrasts very interestingly prejudice against Black people and prejudice against Jews, because as he says, a Jew can hide. A Jew can pretend not to be a Jew. A black person can't hide. He has no escape. And he rightly says that means that he's followed around more by the prejudice. He sees all his interactions in that light uh, than the Jew is. But I also think that there is, a, since Fanon was a psychoanalyst, I think he would be interested in the psychological texture of how you react both to being able to hide and not being able to hide. And I actually think the fact that Jews can hide can itself have a, uh, an unhealthy psychological effect by which you try to disguise your own Jewishness from yourself. You try to pretend you're not Jewish. You try to keep it out of things, say, oh, I'm not like those people and so forth. So there's a lot to explore here about how you receive prejudice as it as it were but i think for the purposes of the enlightenment project insofar as it's conceived as overcoming prejudice the more important claim is how you stop transmitting it and that could include how you stop uh, you stop transmitting it to yourself although that might not be the most important case where the, the transmitter and the receiver are sort of the same um but overcoming prejudice means 
stopping the prejudice in, in its tracks, as it were. And it's certainly true that for most of the Enlightenment, that was seen as an individual process, something that individual agents take on and try to overcome, though, as the first question brought out, that may be a limitation of the Enlightenment project, that maybe that we need to think more socially and think about structures of power and of violence that spread prejudices independently of particular agents, which Fricker also does, I should say. She talks both about agential and structural prejudice. Insofar as we're talking about agential prejudice, however, I think we can use what Smith says or indicates about prejudices of the imagination to help over as individuals overcome that. That doesn't quite, it tells you why I admitted it, but it doesn't answer that. Hi. Um, so I'm a political scientist, and I uh, work on, um, you know, s political sources and economic sources of prejudice, and also I work on interventions that might help to overcome prejudice. So I found your talk very exciting and stimulating to hear from a different disciplinary mm -hmm. perspective. Um, and I have a lot of comments, but I'll li limit it to just a couple of comments. So one, I wanted to touch on um, the notion of contact. And so I think it's clear that if there's, you know, no contact, like how could someone possibly, you know, imagine or change belief or even formulate correct beliefs about um, another group or another, another type of person. But it's clear that not all contact is prejudice reducing. So if, you know, a bunch of refugees flow into, you know, your locality, it turns out people start voting for the right wing party. Um, to a larger degree than places that are otherwise similar but have less refugees. And so it's clear that certain types of contact could be negative, could be prejudice reinforcing, et cetera. Um, and so I think the front, a, a lot of the frontier is understanding what kind of contact, and it doesn't have to be one-on-one, -on -one, uh, but it could be through the media or through other interventions and what types of things are persuasive um, and are they more facts or are they more narratives or other things that help to transport people into the shoes of, uh, of others? So I think that's kind of a, a frontier there. And I think the important point is it's not all contact. It's, you know, we need to explore what kind of contact is actually going to overcome prejudice. But the second thing that I want to touch on is um, that people oftentimes select out of contact with people that they don't like and have deep prejudices against. And so I think that's actually one of the biggest challenges in overcoming prejudice is that if I don't like a group and have a, <laughs> a lot of prejudice, maybe I don't want to read a book about them. Maybe I don't want to listen to a podcast about them. I don't want to be around them. And so now, you know, there's a thought process of, well, how can you then avoid this uh, selection issue? And there are ways, like, you know, there could be targeted ads, you know, in, during television or, um, you know, other ways where people are exposed, maybe through a public school or something like that, where they're kind of a captive audience. But even still, there's sort of a mental uh there could be a mental avoidance. I'm going to shut down and refuse to um, engage cognitively or emotionally with, with the outgroup. So I was curious if you had any thoughts about uh, either the type of contact or the, the selection issue of selecting out of kind of contact, especially positive contact. Yeah, that's a great question. Great comment. Um, so Smith in... Um, the line I quoted, which is thought to be sort of directly from Montesquieu, um, commerce ought naturally to be among nations as among individuals, a bond of union and friendship. That makes it sound as if contact is going to be the thing, right? The great, the great advantage of commerce is that people actually go to other places. And he, he is, that's in the context of um, a complaints that he makes about the way in which Western colonizers have actually had, have not wound up uh, in union and friendship with the people that they contacted, have wound up exploiting them and so forth. He's very anti-colonialist and he's very aware that the wrong kind of contact can make things worse rather than better. Nevertheless, he seems to think that on the whole, the commercial world will improve relations across the world by way of contact. However, the thing that I've 
uh, most stressed in the lecture, and I think that he most stresses in a lot of uh, in a lot of respects, is the uh, importance of imaginative literature more than actual contact. Um, it's striking. Smith is at least among the least racist of 18th century writers. He's about the only, it may be the most, I was tempted to say that, but I don't know enough about the rest. But you have these awful, horrible, racist and sexist comments. Well, sexism, it, Smith is also sexist. But um, you find these horrible racist comments in Hume and Kant um, and Rousseau. But in Smith, you have the rather remarkable tribute to the virtues of Native Americans and Africans. But he didn't know these people. He read about them. Uh, he seems also to have had a gift for um, imagining himself in other people's shoes, which is precisely what he recommends that people do. And I would stress that that's even more important than contact. And indeed, that's one of the reasons why I suggest that if you really want to overcome a prejudice, it's not just the face-to-face -face interaction. It's the face-to-face -face interaction as supplemented by and indeed read through imaginative literature, because it's only then that you really have some sense of what's going on inside. Otherwise, you're just meeting them in a very superficial way. So I think that's very useful. And as for the opting out point, which is, of course, really important, they are, as you say, and you'll, I'm sure, know more about this than I do, there are various ways you can circumvent that. One simple one is childhood education. They're things that kids read in school before they know that they're supposed to be prejudiced or not, or they already are, but they don't necessarily know that this book here is to, meant to alleviate certain prejudices. Here, I would say, the more you, the books simply enter you into the details of other kinds of people, religiously, racially, sexually, whatever, what in any of these modes here, in classes, in terms of class prejudices, and the less they set out explicitly to send a message, you, you're surely more the expert than this than I am. We philosophers don't do empirical work, but I would guess that that's much, much more effective, that preaching is not helpful, in fact, counterproductive, while actually giving the texture of the life of somebody that a child might not otherwise know, that would be most likely to be very effective. If that's true, that fits in, fits with a lot of different themes in Smith, some of which I touched on tonight and some of which I didn't. Um, thank you so much for this fascinating talk. So a bit of this you answered with your response to uh, Cesar's question, but I'm thinking about how to square the argument about prejudices of the imagination and contact and imagining uh, being um, in the position of that person that you have a prejudice about, but how to square this with the example of the woman who is a card-carrying feminist, but she has prejudice against female uh, women in positions of authority. Um, and so I guess for me, the question was, is there any room for power and policy um, and authority structures in uh, in Adam Smith? Or is this just completely ignored that this can be created or reformed by um, by authorities outside of the individual? I don't want to say there's no room. I'm. There are other Adam Smith experts in the room who might jump down my throat if I said that, and I, I can't offhand think of, but I can't offhand think of passages where he discusses something like that. But then again, very few people did in the 18th century. Uh, it's something to which we think, to some extent, Marx and even more Foucault helped uh, sensitize us and help theorize, right? So that's quite recent theory, certainly in the case of Foucault. Uh, so the idea that both power and ideology circulate, uh, and with those two, of course, being linked, circulate, as it were, socially without being in the hands of any particular agent. It's not something that would have been on the scene that anybody is really thinking about in Smith's sign. So I don't think he's necessarily helpful for that. On the other hand, I don't want to rule out the importance of that aspect of prejudice. Um, it's just that there's also the agential aspect, and I can't see how one can even. Ren is good about this. She's well trained in Foucault. This is one of her 
big sources, actually. But she had, tends to emphasize the power of the agent against Foucault at various points, even while taking point on some board some of his his ideas. So I actually recommend her work, particularly for thinking about these things together. But if there is, as I think there is, a strong agential component in combating prejudice, then this, uh, then Smith, I think, remains a useful resource for that aspect of the project. And then we, we can differ on how large that aspect will be. The card-carrying feminist, if she becomes aware that, uh, I don't know, she can't take Hillary Clinton seriously. This was, uh, Fricka's book was written before Clinton was a candidate. I assume she's referring to people in England. Uh, that's where, where she was at the time and where she grew up. Um, rather than Americans, that's what comes to mind for me. Um, but I think a woman might become aware that she has this attitude, possibly from conversations with friends, possibly from wondering why she's resisting what a, a candidate who seems ideologically very uh, aligned with her views. And then if, if she does become aware of it, it would seem to be easier to start combating it. But what one would need is some kind of therapy uh, possibly on one's own, possibly with a therapist. Um, but even if it's on one's own, and actually even if it's with a therapist, there's work that you'd have to do on your own. And that work, I think very much is a matter of getting into your own imaginings, trying to imagine things differently, trying to imagine your way into this, the uh, woman who you otherwise think is a perfectly good candidate for office, but maybe also into yourself and trying to get at why do you see if, if, since you don't believe that women are less good candidates, why do you see them that way? So in that sense, I still think the, the work that Smith uh, points us toward could be very useful. Well, so I'm an economist here. Uh, I'd also first like to thank you for this uh, very enlightening <laughs> talk. So in listening to the arguments about overcoming prejudice, one of the things that struck me that seems like a fairly revolutionary step in the line of argument is to shift the focus from the group to the individual. And rather than focusing on the group as a whole against which a prejudice holds, it is the focus on the conditions and trade-offs that the individual person is facing, the reality that they're in that perhaps may be the root cause of what causes the prejudices after all, afterwards. Uh, that's, of course, a shift that has enormous consequences, because if we can think of changing the conditions and trade-offs that a person faces, then basically we're saying we're giving the poor a chance to grow out of poverty and become rich, to leave the group that they're part of. And so I was wondering whether you would agree with that reading and the importance of that step in the line of argument and where that fits in with uh, some of the things he wrote later in The Wealth of Nations. Uh, most of the quotations actually about the poor come from The Wealth of Nations, not from the theory of moral sentiments. Uh, in fact, I think his mature thoughts about the poor are all to be found in The Wealth of Nations. I don't think that the... Um, I disagree with other Smith scholars that as a famous passage about the poor person in the theory of moral sentiments that I think coming rich, uh, which I don't think is that useful. But one thing that does bear on your question is in the theory of moral sentiments, Smith presents the poor person who dreams of being rich as under an illusion. And I think he always held that. Um, becoming rich is not, in his opinion, a great uh, goal. Becoming better off is, and that yeah, may be what you meant, but I do want to stress yes. it, yes. Uh, because and, and because I, those, I mean, the, the the that actually that distinction figures quite significantly in his thought throughout. The rich, according to him, tend to be self-indulgent. They actually do tend to be lazy, don't do, develop their talents very much, don't contribute very much, at least if they're born rich. Um, and his ideal seems to be basically a middle-class person who is constant, who doesn't stop working and is simply, this is its picture of the prudent man in the last edition of the uh, theory of moral sentiments. His fortune is 
gradually glow, growing more day by day. Um, and that is the condition to which I think he does hope one day the poor can come, um, though he doesn't explicitly say that. The thing is, the switch to the individual, or as you say, switch, I don't, didn't use that word. Smith is always focused on individuals, and he says explicitly in the theory of moral sentiments, we don't care about uh, uh, individuals because they are one unit in a larger society that we care about. We care about society because it's made up of the various different individuals. Um, and it, it, the basic uh, element, building block of moral interaction for him is always one-to-one -one uh, relations between two individuals. And I think that that's actually quite helpful and indeed a corrective to the way the social sciences in later years were often done, including economics, thinking just in terms of groups. Maybe sometimes you need to do that, but he's always thinking about how a particular policy or a particular socioeconomic structure affects the typical individual in a certain position. There's not necessarily a named individual, but it is an individual as representative of a group. And he thinks that that's how we think about human beings. That's what leads us to care about them, respect them or not respect them, not care about them as individuals one by one. I think he's, he's correct in that. I think actually he serves as a healthy corrective in his individualism um, to... Um, tendencies later and among some in the social sciences to dissolve individuals into simply one among many in a larger group. Uh, thank you very much. I think time is, is moving on. We, we, we need to draw to a close. I'm going to abuse my chairmanship position to ask one last question. Um, first of all, I, I, I want to say that uh, uh, for you, for, for me, your, your talk was genuinely enlightening in several dimensions, but in particular, I think, because I'd, I was very familiar with that quote that you gave us about the difference between the philosopher and the street porter is, you know, mainly a matter of education and is not something intrinsic. And I had taken it, I didn't always interpret it that to mean that Smith was methodologically um, innovating in, in social science against many previous people who'd written about how you know, there were intrinsic differences between Greeks and barbarians or between um, Arabs and Berbers, if you take Ibn Khaldun or other people that actually under the skin, everybody's pretty much the same and they respond to incentives. And so I, I'd sort of taken this to be a methodological innovation about how if you want to change society, what you shouldn't do is redress the balance between Arabs and Berbers or between Greeks and barbarians. You, you just want to think about the incentives, giving people the right incentives. And what you, I think, added to that, which is something I hadn't really thought about, was this idea that by imaginatively thinking through what a poor person has to do, you 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 attribute to them new respect. But then I was worried because I remembered that when, for example, the Soviet censors would um, explain why they were clamping down on some dissident novelist, they would say it's because he depicts honest Soviet taxi drivers as decadent. Um, and, you know, this person would be pilloried for, and worse, you know, sent to the gulag because they'd written something in which some honest Soviet taxi driver had a few moments of moral vacillation or whatever it was. And, I mean, isn't there a sense in which censors everywhere um, want to take this argument and pervert it and to say, it's only legitimate to use this imagination in a way that is uplifting. Mm -hmm. And the moment you start exploring anything sort of a bit ambiguous and the sort of thing that, you know, decadent, um, dissident uh, playwrights and novelists like to do, then actually you're, 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 you're actually doing something very bad for society. So, I mean, what would you say to the Soviet censor in that kind of example? Well, uh, I would... I prefer to live in a world with no Soviet census. Uh, clear, Smith clearly did. Unfortunately, he was he lived in a in a time of relative uh, freedom and openness, time and place, and I think that's rather important to why we have his work at all. Um, I do think that part of truly empathizing with someone is also understanding why they may do things that we dislike as well as things that they like that we like and indeed a portrayal of someone that is only uplifting reeks of dishonesty 
and Smith is not for that. And I don't even think even when he's thinking his way through what happens to poor people, he is always uh, meaning simply to praise. So for instance, I mentioned this briefly. Um, I said he manages to excuse, if not quite to justify mob violence. What he does is say that poor people are in, when they up, rise up against when you have uh, rise up against their masters in various you know demonstrations mob scenes that that did happen for higher wages or something in in the 18th century and remember here I think E.P. Thompson's wonderful book on the making of working the work, English working class should be remembered you have the mob in the 18th century and you have a class in the 19th century at this point it's all mob action right and Smith isn't approving of it. He knows they're given to violence, certainly breaking things and so forth, sometimes worse than that, beating people up. He's just trying to explain how they came to that. So I don't think, uh, I don't think he thinks that empathizing with someone, either specifically in the case of the poor person or in other cases, will always be uplifting. Um, and I don't think he should think that because if you do make it always uplifting, it or it's it just seems like well this isn't realistic, it isn't honest, it isn't really an attempt to understand who the person is, and I think that that's the basic element of what he calls sympathy, and we today would call empathy. It isn't it isn't pitying them, it isn't uh, admiring them, it isn't um, it isn't approval or disapproval. What all of those reactions can be a, the appropriate reaction to a person if you have first understood who they are, what they're feeling, what they're going through. So empathy is a first step and it's essential that that empathy be honest. So I think that's what I'd say. Great, well, thank you very much. You, you made a comment at the beginning that suggested you might have come to Toulouse with a bit of prejudice against economists. And I'm hoping that having met one or two, uh, you know, you, you, and presumably there'll be some therapy to follow. Yeah, but I've entered but... into a situation. <laughs> uh, so I, I'm hoping the therapy will be productive and that uh, I'm sure there are people in this room who have prejudices against philosophers and having met you, I'm sure we're all gonna go away and work on our personal therapy. But I would like to say that it's been a, a fascinating and, and wonderful experience to begin that therapy with you. So thank you very much. Thank you.